to the Mobile Monger Podcast, where we go behind the scenes in the cheese world to chat with the people making, selling, or distributing your favorite specialty food products. I'm your host, Janae Muha, certified cheese professional, longtime cheesemonger, and producer advocate. Daphne Zeppos was an ardent supporter of artisan cheese and the community within. She left this world with a vision that strived to continue education and learning through the lens of travel and experience. This became a teaching award bearing her name. As with many things that have been reimagined over the last two years, the Daphne Zeppos Teaching Award has grown into an endowment with two separate awards being offered. In this episode, I talk with Rachel Jewell and Sam Frank about what this means for the organization and for those applying. If you've ever been interested in applying, we break down how things have changed, the process, and how Daphne's legacy lives anew. Grab a beverage and a bite because this episode holds all the answers to those questions you have about DZTV. Executive Director of the Daphne Zeppos Teach and Endowment, uh, which funds two scholarships for cheese professionals, the Daphne Zeppos Teaching Award and the Daphne Zeppos Research Award. Hello, my name is Sam Frank, and I'm currently serving as co-president of the Board of Directors for the Daphne Zeppos Teaching Endowment. I first got into cheese back in 2009 um, after doing one year of college at the University of Vermont where I, I was an ecological agriculture major. I found that I was not very academically driven and I just really wanted to work on a farm. And so I spent a summer working on the student run vegetable farm. And then at the end of that summer, uh, when the growing season was over, I was like, oh, I guess I better find another job. Like, where can I find a job on a farm in the winter? And I will never forget my good friend, Kate Turcott, who has been in the cheese industry for many years now, who had been my RA at the University of Vermont. I bumped into her at a potluck and she was working at that point as a cheesemaker at Shelburne Farms. And I was just like, Kate, any chance Shelburne's hiring right now? And she was like, yeah, we're actually looking for an assistant cheesemaker. And apparently they got like hundreds of applications for this assistant cheesemaking job. And I don't know what strings Kate pulled to get her college dropout friend a job as an assistant cheesemaker, but she is the one who changed the course of my life. I love it. Because, you know, there's always that one person that does it. So. That's right. Yeah. And I will always shout her out. Yeah. So what are you doing now? What is your role now in the cheese world? I am currently uh, the assistant herd manager at Bobolink Dairy and Bakehouse in Milford, New Jersey, where we milk, give or take 60 cows of mixed breed genetics, primarily Carries, Guernseys, Ayrshire's, Jerseys, pretty much all mutts, um, and make raw milk cheeses uh, seven days a week while the cows are milked. Wonderful. So we are here to talk about the Daphne Seppos um, teaching endowment. Um, And Jewel, I want you to kind of run us through what this used to look like and what it looks like now. Yeah. So um, the organization started in 2012 after the woman Daphne Seppos, who this um, organization was named after and inspired by. Uh, She passed away from lung cancer in July of 2012, but um, after a very brief diagnosis, um, or short diagnosis, I should say. Um, but she wrote a vision with her friends, Ari Weinswig of Zingerman's Community of Businesses, Jason Hines of Meals Yard Dairy, and Mo Frechette of Zingerman's Mail Order and Essex Street Cheese, her partners in her company. And she wrote a vision with them of how she wanted her legacy. She knew she only had four months left to live, and she wanted to help continue and make sure that the work she had done for um, cheese education would carry on. And so she had them help her set up an endowment that would fund this one award, which she called Daphne Zeppel's Teaching Award. And so they all, uh, I got hired um, right away in order to just help 
build the organizational side of things. So how are we going to fundraise, set up a website? Uh, how are we going to get the word out, have some documents ready for the board to use, to talk to people about, uh, set up a Facebook page, set up, um, uh, make some pins so that people can recognize you at ACS conference because we we're about to go off to Raleigh. Um, and so that's how it all kind of started in July of 2012 was that she had passed away and the goal was to have a scholarship that was $5,000 that would allow for an American or North American cheese professional to write a essay vision that would, they could be about any subject they wanted based in Europe about cheese. And the goal would be that they had to come back um, after their travels to Europe. They had $5,000 to do that. And they would come back and um, teach at the American Cheese Society Conference. So they would have this opportunity not only to really learn about what they felt really invested in, which she always was really passionate about, because if you really care about something, you're going to talk about it more, you're going to teach about it more and get really invested. And those are always the more interesting teachers to listen to when they actually really care about what they're talking about. So she liked that idea of making sure that this was their vision. And then now helping these younger, kind of tend to be younger cheese professionals in the sense of maybe less connected cheese professionals, not necessarily age, have a platform to teach. And so that American Cheese Society Conference presentation would be the way to um, kind of kick that off, but then really keep teaching. So would it be on a small local scale for them? Um, would it be on a bigger scale, depending on the subject matter, depending on their connections, whatever it was, the organization would help that like teaching to keep happening in some way. And then every year this uh, we'd have new recipients of it. So we're now, um, that's how it all started. We had to fundraise to just get the scholarship off the ground. Um, and so we're always in a state of fundraising because now we're actually launching a second scholarship. So in 10 years, the organization was always just known by the one scholarship because that's what we did. Um, but in the last really two years, um, right, it started before COVID, but COVID really kind of accelerated some goals was that we wanted to be able to offer kind of more educational learning opportunities for people. One in the form of a scholarship. So one that didn't require travel. Um, we had found a lot of people had reasons they couldn't ever apply to the DZTA, um, maybe because of life circumstances or just whatever it was. Um, so maybe we could still give them something to get excited about through another opportunity. So the research award was born for that. Um, and then we also had a more robust kind of dynamic board of directors at this point who were really, um, we wanted to kind of organize them better um, and kind of create more of this endowment organization that now is funding two scholarships, but is also doing other things. So by providing other educational opportunities, whether it be webinars or um, kind of social networking um, opportunities for people to grow in the industry and meet other like-minded people, um, so that's kind of the direction we're headed now is that this greater umbrella organization that provides educational opportunities and those can be in different ways. And so my job is to somehow manage all that. And I don't know why people told me that I was the one that did it, but I am. <laughs> and so 10 years later, I'm still in charge, which is weird. <laughs> Rachel, Jewell. Rachel Jewell is the glue that holds the endowment together. Yeah, that's what I hear. That's what I hear. <laughs> that's, I mean, it's not a surprise, honestly, knowing you so well, Jewel. That's definitely not a surprise. Um, I love how this is kind of um, transformed. Daphne was such a dynamic person that like, it makes sense that it would continue on in another dynamic way and get bigger and do more because that was the type of person Daphne was. I only had the opportunity of meeting her once very randomly at, um, Seattle cheese festival that was happening at Pike place market. And she was at one of the shops that was right at the base of space needle. And I walked in and was with my husband and he had no idea who she was. And I was like, oh my God, that's Daphne Zappos. Like, Oh my God, <laughs> like, this is a, this is a big moment. Um, and you know, her warmth just in that moment was so huge. And she made me feel like I was the biggest person that could have walked in the room and, I will never forget that. Um, so I love to see her vision kind of being passed through and giving that to other people. Um, yeah. I would love any stories of Daphne, of either of you two, of like just what um, the memories with of her and how this translates into what y'all are doing now. 
Okay. I'll let Jewel answer just because I actually never met her. Okay. Um, oh man, I have so many because I've related to work with Essex and some of them are my own. My sister has been with Essex now for, I mean, since the beginning, basically. So 15 years. Um, so I have a lot through her, but I, I did meet her. And I think what I really love was when I saw it and when I would hear about her consistently was like an insatiable joy about cheese and the people in cheese. And she just had, like you said, she had, she'd have this like kind of sparkle whenever she got excited about something. And it could be something really, really small, like seemingly small, right? Like, and, um, but that passion and that excitement and that person, uh, real sense of personal attachment to something, it was very real and very tangible, everything to her. Um, you know, like I just, she would just light up if she got the chance to meet a monger and they loved her product that she loved so much. And so it was like this like kindred spirit moment she would have where it's like someone else who gets me kind of. Um, and cause she was that kind of just like intense Greek who was just really, really passionate. Um, she could care less about a spreadsheet. Um, and she was very vocal about that, <laughs> like very regularly, which is a nightmare when you're running a business. Um, but she was like, no, I'd much rather sit there and have the conversation. I'd much rather like actually connect with someone and eat the food and, you know, just the little moments. And so I try whenever I travel, especially when I'm in Europe, um, I always have this sense of like, like a, a strange, like, like not a presence that she's there, but I try to like act like how would she feel and what would she move? She had a way of like moving in a space that was very aware and present. She wasn't that person. I just think of now where we're at in the world, we're always on a phone or we have our headphones in and we kind of create a tunnel vision and we block out the world. Daphne was always very aware of the world around her. You'd sit in a restaurant with her and she noticed every bartender and she noticed every person walking by or the details of a piece of art on the wall. Uh, she just noticed things. Um, she'd interrupt a conversation for a really delicious bite of food. Um, or a funny thing she noticed, you know? And so whenever I try to travel, I always try to have that like sense of presence in a moment. And especially when it comes to, in, so I think she really used all five senses at all times. And that was something that when I started taking on more of a role at Essex, so I work for Essex Street Cheese and kind of in marketing and education. And I try to help then pass this along to recipients of the award is when they're in places take note of what the room smells like and like have that imprint on a memory. Education is also getting your five senses involved, not just head knowledge. And um, I think for her, she was so emotional about cheese because she included her five senses. It wasn't just head knowledge. And so that's why when you said you, you know, you saw her and she made you feel like the most important person in the room was because she ignited all five senses in you. Right. Like it was just this incredible thing. And that's why you wanted to hear her talk about anything was because she just was so romantic about it, but yet real. Like it wasn't just this like putting on thing. And that's because she was just so present all the time. And I try to when I when I travel, I'm like, OK, what does this room smell like? What am I crunching underneath my feet? Or what are the people dressed like in this place? Just have all those extra things feed your memory. And when we have people write visions for their scholarship, you know, a lot of the times you're so worried about the education side of it and the, the to-do list. And it's like, but also part of the to-do list is like being immersed in that because that is why you travel somewhere is to get that je sais quoi, that gut in your stomach that you can't replicate anywhere else. And if you can get that gut in your stomach feeling because of a place you were and come back and can communicate that, I think of like the best example is like Vince Razio now who won in, um, I'm going to 2017. So he presented in 2018. Uh, he went to um, England and visited cheese stores. So cheese caves, uh, cheddar caves, and he put cotton balls in all of the caves and let them sit for three months and then captured them in a seal and brought them back. And we all got to smell the cotton balls and they smelled just like the caves. Mm -hmm. And immediately that cheese now tasted, it had a story 
to it. It had, you, you knew it all, but he, I felt like he captured that of like, no, what does this room smell like? And that made his presentation incredible, but you could never have written that experience out on a PowerPoint. That would have made no sense in a PowerPoint. And I just think that was always what I loved about Daphne. And I love, again, carrying that through in the scholarship. I try really hard. That's what made her, there can always be a scholarship available for G's. Someone else can make a scholarship. They can have an imprint. But if we're going to give away scholarships, if we're going to have people earn these scholarships, I want that thing that Daphne did to like kind of match each person. And hopefully you can get a little bit of that when they teach right? Something kind of lights your stomach on fire a little bit and you feel like you're like mentally transported into their shoes. But Daphne always could do that. Yeah. Well, Sam, from someone who didn't get the opportunity to meet Daphne, um, how do you see her vision in the work that you're doing and how do you kind of encapsulate that into uh, the role that you play now as a part of the endowment? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm very sad just having been so intimately involved with this organization now for so long that I didn't ever have the opportunity to meet Daphne, but certainly like one, one overarching theme is, and sort of, you know, jumping off of what Jules said as well, is just how, and you too, Janae, just how incredibly positively infectious she was towards everyone that she met uh, and encountered. Um, and in fact, you know, and, and for me, it's just even in lots of places where I don't expect it when I t might tell a random person I'm meeting that I'm involved in this organization. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was returning to Bobble Link Dairy where I'm working now after doing a farmer's market for them. And there was a, a woman there who was interviewing one of the owners and she, she keeps, she has a website where she writes about local food producers just in New Jersey. It's a very like local regional thing. Uh, so she's cheese adjacent, but certainly not a cheese industry professional by any means. And um, I just, she started asking me about what I do and my background. And I happened to bring up that I'm on this board and she just interrupted me. And she was like, wait, she Greek cheese Daphne. And she would like, we had to stop. She, she literally started like tearing up in that moment. And I had to like give her some time before we could continue the conversation because she had met Daphne, you know, I don't even like 10 or more. I would have been more than 10 years ago at this point, um, just at some event, you know, one time. And it left such a such a lasting impact on her. So I guess, you know, in regards to, you know, how do I try to, you know, how, like what part of Daphne do I try to carry through? It's just, you know, how can we content, you know, Working in artisan cheese is kind of like one of the craziest things that you can do. Um, you know, it's you're certainly not in it for the money. Um, and so you have to, you know, you have to carry that type of infectious passion for the product and for the story and, and everything about it. And in it, you know, just from everything that I've learned and heard about Daphne, no one did it better than her. And if there's one thing that we can all do uh, you know, for those of us that that are the crazy ones that have devoted our lives to this is just, you know, try to spread as much joy and passion and love and interest for cheese as we possibly can, just like she did. I love that. Um, so, Sam, you are also a recipient of this award. Um, I would love to hear your process of like picking a topic and how you uh, worked through that to ultimately winning in the presentation, because I know a lot of people listening to this might be interested in doing it, but they're scared and they don't really know how to start. Um, so can you kind of give me a little bit of a snapshot of what that looked like for you? Yes, absolutely. Um, first and foremost, I always like to reiterate to folks, uh, I, I received the award after my second attempt applying. So don't ever be dissuaded if you apply once and you don't receive the award. Apply again, you know, hone in on your idea, change your idea. Um, so I actually applied my first time the very first year. And so I was a young freshman cheesemonger at DeBruno Brothers, fresh out of college, when I learned that they had created this award. And that was also right around the time that I met Rachel Jewell for the first time. And I was... I think I really inundated you with questions all about it uh, when you were working behind the counter during the holidays with us. Um, 
And, you know, I had just, I just graduated college the year before and actually right after college, um, I spent three months woofing in Italy, which if anyone listening isn't familiar with the organization of woof, and especially if you're in your early twenties and don't know what to do with your life, I cannot recommend it more highly. It's a basically a, a worldwide network of farms where you can go and volunteer. Um, pretty much every country in the world has farms that are part of Woof, and you essentially just go there and, and work in exchange for room and board. Um, so I did that in Italy for three months with three different cheesemakers, one in Tuscany, one in Lombardy, and one in Val d'Aosta. And that was easily like, you know, that was, it was life transforming for me. And I think very much so like solidified my passion and, and my direction in life and, and sticking with it, you know, and this has been, you know, 10 years later at this point. Um, and so, you know, here I am a year later at Bruno Brothers and they've created a word to essentially like pay someone to do this thing that I love so much. And so, I didn't really have an idea. I just knew I had to apply. And so, and, and I had just, re, like, so I guess back in 2012 or 2011, there was some great article about Corsican cheeses. And I just read that article and I was like, all right, I'm gonna write a vision about going to Corsica. And, you know, I'm a huge procrastinator. I did it all the night before. Uh, but, you know, I did, like, I got the letters of recommendation. You know, I went, I, you know, I updated my resume. I went through the process. And I think just going through the process in and of itself is really valuable. Um, and then, you know, the next two years, I actually took those years off uh, from applying. I didn't, I hadn't really come up with what I thought was like, you know, my quote, winning vision, unquote. Um, and so I sort of just took time to try to think, think, think things through a little bit more. Um, so then in 20, uh, 2016 is when I applied. Uh, I was working at Crown Finish Caves at that point in time, and we, this is a, a cheese, an Afinor cheese distributor in Brooklyn, New York. And we were working on, at that point, we had been working on this project to try to find a producer to make a Ragu Sano style cheese, uh, which is a, a very sort of peculiar uh, Sicilian pasta filata in the Provolone family. And so we had done a lot of background research about Ragusano, and then I was, you know, getting pretty fascinated by it. And so I thought maybe this would be a really good project idea. Is I'll, I'll, I'll write a vision about like studying Ragusano, and I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to like apply that to the American cheese industry, but I'll figure it out. And but one of the things that I was really interested in with the Ragusano cheese was the the breed of Sicilian cow that was very closely affiliated with it, the Modicana. Um, they're an ancient cow breed. Uh, that are unique to Southern Sicily, which for those of you who don't know, like Southern Sicily is further south than Northern coast of Africa. It's very dry, very arid, not your typical cow conditions, but somehow this particular breed actually is able to thrive there year round. And, and I already had this sort of interest in her heritage breeds or heirloom breeds, um, however you like to call them. Um, going back to my time when I was at that, that one year, that one fateful year at the University of Vermont, uh, where I'd heard a talk given by a, a, a very uh, well-renowned biodynamic farmer in northern Vermont by the name of Doug Flack, who owns Flack Family Farm and has a herd of American milking Devon. And so this is actually even before I was interested in cheese. Um, I learned about these cows, the American milking Devon, that were the original cow of New England and were very uh, multi-purpose breed, very good at producing beef and dairy just off of the marginal, you know, New England forage uh, of hundreds of years ago, uh, and also made really good draft animals and had fallen out of favor in modern times because, you know, they could do milk, beef and draft really well, but they couldn't do one of them exceptionally the way that modern specialized breeds could. So as I was learning more about Ragusano and the Modicana, it was sort of like bringing back this interest for me uh, in heritage breeds, which is something I just hadn't really thought about for a long time. And I spent a lot of time sort of like hashing out this idea with uh, my boss at Crown Finish Case at the time, Benton Brown, who's the owner and founder with his wife, Susan Boyle. And, you know, at that point, he was sort of like, OK, yeah, the Ragusano thing's a cool idea, but maybe you should talk more about the cows. And um, I also, uh, I reached out to Adam Moskowitz um, to see if he would meet with me and sort of hear a little bit more about my idea and, you know, and give me some tips and pointers and whatever. 
And um, so he basically reiterated what Benton was saying, which was, you know, yeah, I don't know the cheese is cool, but maybe talk more about the cows, like these heritage breeds. Like that's something I wasn't really ever aware of. And, you know, I'd love to learn more about that. And so um, I would really, I would credit the both of them quite a bit with me deciding to go down that path with writing my vision and changing the focus from a particular cheese to a much broader topic uh, of heritage breeds and their wider impact on dairy farming and agriculture and cheese making and all of that. Um, so I guess that would be my, one of my, you know, I guess my first tip was, you know, don't be dissuaded if you don't receive the grant your first time around, always keep applying. Uh, my second tip is like, uh, don't procrastinate and wait till the night before, like I did the first time. Start just, you know, hashing things out. Doesn't even mean you need to start writing things down. Um, but just like, you know, talk it out, uh, you know, well in advance. Start really like developing your idea. Um, and then, yeah, the next thing would be like, you know, people that you look up to that you know and that you trust, talk to them and like ask them for advice and information and, you know, get get feedback on on your vision. And so, which ties back into, you know, point number two, which don't procrastinate too much. Give yourself like enough time to, you know, to be able to hash things out. Because if I had waited until the night before, yet again, I probably would have stuck with this original idea and who knows what would have happened. But I'm really glad that I gave myself this time. I talked to people that I, you know, that I looked up to and that I trusted that helped me sort of form my vision. Um, and yeah, and then, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, you get with the with the DZTA, you do two letters of recommendation. With the DZRA, we do one letter of recommendation right now. Um, but, you know, I would say also like really, um, you know, we having gone through, you know, having been on the other side of the application process now a number of times and, and read through a lot of applications. You know, you get these beautifully written letter, you know, letters of recommendation recommendation that are you know a page long waxing poetic about this person and then sometimes you get like the three intense long like hey this person's great and then you, that's that's sort of it so I would just also really recommend that you know you think you be really thoughtful about who you ask for about your letter of recommendation like you're probably a great person that deserves to have someone talk really you know really highly of you and so make sure you go to that person um, and so yeah you know just think think things through very critically and, uh, you know, and just give yourself the time to do it. That's, that's sort of what, that's my best advice to any potential applicant. I love all those tips because you tapped into your community, um, which helped you fine tune your idea and bounced other things of like, oh, that's something that I would really be interested in. Like, yeah, the cheese is cool, but like, let's talk more about the heritage breeds. Like I can totally see that in conversation with a multitude of my friends of, just digging deeper into a topic. So I love all those tips. Um, in your travel time for the presentation, were there any like surprising themes that kind of came up um, that you weren't expecting? Did you have some like preconceived notions of what you were going to come away with? And did that change throughout the process? Yes. And I guess I'll, I'll answer that question two times. Um, so in, in one way, uh, I would just say logistically, it changed pretty, pretty dramatically. Uh, if you read my original vision um, and compare that with where I actually went uh, for my, my uh, after I received the grant, uh, they were pretty different. Um, and so in, in that regard, I would say, you know, um, you know, people just shouldn't, don't feel like you're, if you apply, you know, don't feel like you are going to be held to executing this vision word for word. Um, you know, the reason that we select the recipients that we do is because we like your vision, which is a very broad thing. And we trust that you are going to carry it out in the best way possible. And so I, I think in my initial vision, I talked about just going to like Italy and France, I believe. Um, I haven't reread it, you know, in a, in a number of years, but uh in the end, I ended up going to Spain, Italy, Switzerland, Ireland, Scotland, and England. And um, so I, you know, I, 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 lo I really love to travel and I've, uh, and I, I, I'm pretty good at traveling cheap. Um, and so a lot of my plan, you know, I basically bought a one-way ticket uh, to Spain and uh, I didn't know when I would be coming home and I didn't actually even know like what my whole agenda for my travels were at that point. And a lot of them formed as I went. 
And so like France, which had been a major theme and my vision, I didn't end up even going to mostly just because, you know, the, the professional, you know, like when you, when you receive the, the award, um, you basically have a whole team of current and past board members that are available to you to connect you with anywhere you want to go, which is remarkable. Um, it just so happened that like my connections for France, the producers there, like none of them really panned out. And I'm, I'm a terrible second language person. I can speak a few languages, like, you know, like 10 words, um, but I'm not fluent in anything. And French is like the one that intimidates me the most. So between like not, not being able to speak the language and none of the connections really panning out, I was just like, all right, I'm not gonna go to France. That's all right. Like I'll go to these other places instead. Um, and it all ended up being incredible. Like I can't, I mean, I am so thankful for every single producer that I met all along the way. Um, you know, the United, you know, if, if you're from the United States, you, and, and you haven't traveled abroad or you haven't been abroad in a really long time, uh, you sort of forget that there's a level of hospitality out there that we don't necessarily, you know, I don't want to bash my home country here, but, you know, people in the United States don't let strangers into their home the, the same way that I've experienced uh, going overseas. And so, you know, just don't don't be afraid to your plans change on the fly. Uh, that's definitely what happened to me. And it was all it all turned out really, really well. So just, yeah, from a logistical perspective, yeah, I was barely, you know, sort of uh, surprised with how much my plans changed, but very gratified with how it all turned out. Um, and then the other the other part of that, which I don't want to be too much of a Debbie Downer here, but when I initially wrote my vision about heritage breeds, it was really about traveling to Europe to places where, you know, cheesemakers and dairy farmers continued to work with their regional heritage breeds rather than modern, uh, what we call improved or specialized dairy breeds um, and find out, you know, why did they continue to do that? And then perhaps, you know, my initial intention was to then come back to the United States and talk about it and try to inspire more people here to do the same thing because there's, there's virtually no, there, there's virtually no commercial cheesemaker in the United States working exclusively with the milk of a North American heritage breed. Um, unfortunately, what I, what I really discovered is that it's sort of a more dire situation than, than I had realized and that heritage breeds, at least everywhere that I went, are in tremendous decline. And there are very few farmers and cheesemakers left anywhere that are continuing to work with them. And so it's really, um, it's probably the most anti-capitalist thing that you can do. Um, you know, the main reason that they've fallen out of favor is because they just can't compete in, in the volume of milk produced as, as with a, uh, a modern improved dairy breed. Um, and so it did sort of change, you know, my angle a little bit. And now that I, you know, I sort of am, am trying to be an advocate more, I consider myself an advocate for the promotion of heritage breeds, um, not just from, a, you know, I think there's a, a really good terroir driven argument to be made. Like if you want to really express the taste of place in your cheese, the best way possible is to do that with the breed of animal from that region. But more so the heritage breeds, they all arose from the days of, you know, what I like to call real peasant agriculture. Um, and so when, you know, when farmers were very poor and they needed animals that could subsist off of whatever that landscape was and those climactic conditions and the topography and whatever, they had to be able to thrive wherever that was. So going back to the Modicana cow of Southern Sicily, like how does a cow thrive outdoors year round? Well, you know, it's through the hard work and a community of farmers over many, many, many generations of selectively breeding for the, the animals to perform the best in those conditions. And as we look forward, you know, in this uh, in these days of a you know a rapidly changing climate and resource depletion, I think it's going to be even more important that you know as long as animal agriculture continues, that we find a way to do it uh, with lower input animals and heritage breeds can really be a, a key to that you know to solving that problem. I don't think that that was Debbie Downer at all. It's just the reality of the situation and the reality isn't always as bright and shiny as we would like to think it is. <laughs> yes, true. Very true. And I think but just to kind of add, yeah. And I think just kind of add to that though, like the fact is though that you did it, 
you found another thing that we should talk about though. And so that is actually incredibly positive, right? Like it was like, you just found something different to talk about. Like, you're like, this is actually the real issue of like what we need to talk about. Yeah. It's instead of it being kind of this, like a head space, philosophical conversation of like, Oh, it would just be so nice to like bring back these heritage breeds. Like, no, we really need to be bringing them back. Cause like, if we don't, we're going to lose them. And like, we're losing a sense of this culture. We're losing a sense of like this identity of agriculture. Right. Like, and so I think that is actually, instead of it being, yeah, it's a Debbie Downer in the sense of like, you thought you kind of had a thesis you were trying to prove the thesis just changed. You didn't lose an entire thesis. You just had to get a new one. And I think to your point of what you said, Sam, is that trying to make sure that when people apply that we're not, yes, obviously we're going to hold you to a framework of like this, like, don't tell me you're going to go and travel and learn about heritage breeds and decide instead you're going to go and learn about starter cultures. Like, please don't do that, right? Like, don't literally change everything about it. But yeah, like within that framework, there's, we understand the world is not cookie cutter. It's just not. And so then, especially when you're trying to travel. So like being flexible to that and good things still can come out of it, even if it's vastly different than what you thought you were going to get. It's still good that came out of it. Yeah, just to piggyback quickly off of that, uh, in particular, traveling during a global pandemic, we are very understanding that plans sometimes change. Right. Yes. And <laughs> in yeah, a big way. That, <laughs> yeah. Like, and with that, you know, like in 2020, we had a recipient out, like on the, in Egypt and Italy, like, right. We had, or didn't get to go to Italy. And so we had to come home. And, but, and so we're, you know, she felt obviously a sense of loss of like, she didn't get to like actually go to Italy and she missed out on some part of Portugal and things like that. But her content from Greece and Egypt alone was incredibly inspiring. And actually what we found out when she went through her mock presentation with us is you couldn't have fit in Italy and Portugal if you wanted to, like, and she kind of tried, she did some like personal research. She just did research. She would do interviews like from afar. And we actually had her cut them. We're like, actually, Greece and Egypt, that's this presentation. And like, focus on that. That's amazing. And in the future, carry on in your research in Italy and Spain if you or in Portugal if you want to. But again, yeah, we're very accommodating understanding because we actually had to go through that. And again, it could have been a Debbie Downer. And instead, it was like, actually, what we realized was you got some incredible things. It kind of ended up being like a, a happy uh, change of affairs in that sense. Your quality of presentation was really great because it wasn't diluted by having too much stuff in there. Actually, it worked out well. I guess that kind of brings me to the question of how involved with um, the theme ultimately is the board when you're working this stuff out and you you've already done the travel, or you know the recipient has already done the travel. They kind of have their idea together. How involved is the board in fine tuning it and making it to the final presentation? Yeah. Uh, so that's evolved over time, definitely. Um, I would say, so I'll speak more to like currently how it's done, because in the past, it definitely was a bit more certain board members were more involved than others just because of maybe to kind of same point connections. Uh, they had, they knew the area you're going to, they knew the people, they knew they kind of already had a personal understanding of it so they could kind of help you. And there's a lot more involvement during the planning stage earlier on of like, hey, we can kind of help you. You're going to have this brain dump of ideas will help you kind of figure out where you really should go, what really will be interesting, and then just kind of help you along the way, though, somewhat removed. Now, so what we have is we actually have a committee formed. Um, and so it's the Recipient Support Committee, uh, Support and Education Committee. And so that they're kind of carrying you through from beginning to end. So they, with a uh, the great example is Mary Casella, who just won the, uh, received the research award uh, this last summer. She has you know, incredible idea. She came to us with all these great research she had already done. But in the initial phases, you know, we're like, maybe go off at the kind of what Sam said, go off in that direction. Like that seems really interesting. But at the end of the day, you do what you want to do. But like to us, that's really compelling. And so kind of steering when you, what many recipients realize actually is they get very overwhelmed by like how much they can learn. And so the committee really helps with that, where it's like, hey, actually, yeah, that's technically interesting, but like that's compelling. And so like kind of steering them in the initial decision making, maybe of content or research or places to go, connections to visit, things like that. Um, and then afterwards, yeah. So then at that point, you know, it really depends on the recipient. 
Um, so some recipients, you know, uh, Ann Campbell is an example of one. She is an incredible student and had already done master's level like presentations. So re didn't really need a lot of handholding in that way, right? Like, so it was more of like, then she did a mock presentation for us. We gave feedback during that. And it was more kind of like editing um, things like that, not really steering the direction. Sometimes in the past, so we've had people who are a bit more not as familiar with having to make a presentation in front of 150 people at a packed full of room of people, you know, I'll never forget my first presentation at ACS and Ari Weinswick and Deborah Dickerson walk in and I was like, can you please leave? Like, I don't want to look at you right now. Like, no, like you're not allowed to be in here. This is right. Like, so you, but that fear can really overwhelm an experienced speaker. So then there'll be a bit more of that kind of helping with just even the mechanics of how to present. Um, I know a Tom Perry, that was a lot of it when he first started was like the, the word whiskers or the nerves of like, oh, what if I, how do I make sure I pack everything in? So he kind of spoke really, really quickly. Um, and it was like, well, we got to make sure people understand you. So it was more of like little, it was certain people, depending on what kind of experience they're walking in with, with the board caters, the support we give. Um, and that's really why over the years that committee then was formed because it's a designated people kind of on standby. Like, do you need us? When do you need us? And it's catered for every single recipient and even through each season of like your journey on this. Some need it way more support early, early on. Some need it later on. Um, and some need it the whole time through. Some, you know, maybe not as much. So yeah, it really varies. But we built that committee in order to be available to cater like how much support you need. Yeah. I feel like we could all use a committee just in our own lives of support. So I love this on a like bigger level of a big presentation sort of deal. Yeah. I feel like we should rename the committee, Sam, to like something that's more of like pep talk committee or like moral support committee. Like Yes. <laughs> that is a lot of what of what we do is just, you know, checking in regularly and saying, hey, everything's gonna be okay. You're doing great. Yeah. And sometimes that, it, you know, we, we schedule, you know, we book, you know, these check-in meetings with the recipients, you know, once every couple of months. And sometimes there's something pertinent to talk about. Like when we spoke with Matt Benham prior to this virtual presentation that he just did last week. Um, sometimes it's just like, Hey, how's it going? You okay? Anything you need from us? Like you're doing great. Like, let us know if you need anything. And then, you know, and that's all it is, but we're like, we are there. We are present and we're, you know, we're here to help however we can. Yeah. And with that kind of too, so you can have someone like, uh, so when, when you use the award money, we don't ask for receipts on how you use it. And so you might have, um, some people have had like with Sam, he had incredible flexibility with his job. He could obviously buy a one-way ticket and just go to Europe and not everybody has that freedom. Right. And there might be juggling more of their professional things or family commitments and things like that. So that's also part of what the committee is trying to help with is like, what are you juggling right now? In addition to like this now award that you received. Um, and so how can we help time budget you? even um, with those things, understanding that we're not the only thing that's on your plate sometimes. Um, you know, are there things that your employers are asking of you and they're not giving you the time they need? Can we help with that in any way or not? Or can we just offer support and adjust your workload? So again, that's also when, when we have a lot of people have anxiety about applying and then they have anxiety about receiving the award and they have anxiety about presenting the award. Our goal is to make sure that that anxiety as, like, is as managed as possible without patronizing you, because we understand this is a big responsibility, but like, how can we mitigate those in some way and take that pressure off of this has to be perfect or that you have to somehow, you know, book everything right away and these harsh deadlines or whatever. It's very, it's a lot of work for the board because it's very customized for yeah. every single recipient. We don't have this like form of support that you get. So it is, we, we give a lot of time and a lot of energy because it's not a one size fits all kind of customer service that we're providing to your recipients. But I think you get better results from it. I'd like to think I'm not a recipient, but I hope they would say that, um, that they get better results. Well, I, I will say, you know, when the year where I was the recipient, that committee had not yet been formed and I had a lot of anxiety and I would have loved to have an entire committee of people just telling me like, don't worry, Sam, it's all going to be okay. Like, let us know what you need. And uh, that would have been great. So I think it has been a very valuable asset ever since it's creation. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that's also kind of back to your question earlier, Janae, about, you know, how has the organization changed? And 
early on, the focus was just this idea Daphne had of giving away a scholarship. And again, like I said, as much as we love her, she hated spreadsheets, which really meant she really hated organization and like to do lists and timing and, you know, executing things. She had the great ideas. Um, and uh, so, yeah, okay, you got to get a scholarship out, you got to raise money. But then all of a sudden I was like, well, now how do you actually, the person received the award, what do we do with them now? And then, oh, I don't know, we don't have a plan for that. And, you know, and then like, oh, we um, uh, want to advertise it more. We have questions about the award. Oh, we didn't pay you sheet that was really exhaustive, all those kinds of things. So as time went on, we get feedback from our recipients we get feedback from people who are applying and we tried to put that into the board over time. Um, and so, yeah, it's very, for those who've been around since day one, yeah, I bet the first uh, four recipients, you being the fourth one, Sam, would be like, oh man, that committee would have been great. And I'm like, I'm so sorry, <laughs> but like we were also brand new and I was like one person and we were trying our best, you know? Um, so, but I, I am proud of the organization in that sense that we've always tried to be really um, not tone deaf and to really listen. And as much as possible, when we have the resources to implement like improvements in the organization, sometimes we can't do it right away because we don't have the resources for it, either financially or bandwidth. But um, I think we're moving in a good direction where we can start giving as much support as possible to applicants, uh, donors, and and to recipients, like, and to those who benefit from the education that we're giving. I'm hoping we're moving in that direction. I like to think so. Um, I would love to just get into the nitty gritty of the, what does the application process look like now? What's the deadlines? Let's get, how do people find all of this information? Well, we have a beautiful and lovely new website, um, largely due to one of our wonderful new board, board members, Amy, uh, and she created, uh, she helped us create this new website, which is dzte.org. That's the Daphne Zeppos Teaching Endowment, so dzte.org. Uh, and if you go there right now, uh, we have both applications are live, so you can click uh, the link to apply for the DCTA or click the link to apply for the DCA. And just to reiterate, the DCTA is the Daphne Zeppos Teaching Award, uh, and it's an award worth fi uh, $5,500. And this is the, the original award um, with the focus on traveling to Europe uh, to learn you know, something, something truly visionary and cutting edge about cheese, which you will then bring back and teach at the, the subsequent year American Cheese Society annual conference. The DZRA is our, our new award. So this is only the second year that we've offered it. It's the Daphne Zeppos Research Award. And so this one is not, uh, you can certainly travel, but that's not the focus of this one. So this is a research-based award so that you, know, you can really do it from anywhere. It's very open-ended in terms of what topic you choose as well as how you present it. Um, Mary, who was our first recipient, does she just happens to be presenting at ACS in Portland this summer, but that wasn't a requirement. She chose to do that. So we're not requiring the recipient for the DZRA to apply or to present at ACS. So they can they can really we we actually left it very open ended in how they want to culminate their project, whether it's something, you know, a written product or a video presentation or anything, you know, where we're, we're really leaving it up to, to the recipient to decide on that front. Currently, both applications are live. Uh, application season started on March 1st. The DZRA applications will be due on May 1st. The DZTA applications will be due on May 31st. All right, it's coming up quick. Yeah, and uh, things that we've kind of included. So some, some of those who might be familiar with like the DZTA application process in the past might be because you've applied before. So there are some, a couple tweaks. Um, we incorporated in the last couple of years um, an elevator pitch. So we did this for both actually. Um, and the reason, so you have the core kind of, we have this vision we keep talking about. Uh, we're in the middle of actually getting ready to launch a, um, we did a successful visioning series with Zing Train last year that people were able to attend, but we're about to launch. So it's hosted on our website, um, a short, like kind of 10 minute video of kind of helping with tips on the visioning process. Cause sometimes people really struggle with that. 
um, the actual gatekeeper to applying. So we're releasing more resources about that too. Um, and it's going to be made up of people who uh, are on the board, those who have received the award before, um, people in the industry who use visioning. So it's going to be hopefully a very helpful tool. Um, but this elevator pitch was because so the vision is a written essay, right? Um, and so what we wanted though, because you have this board who's receiving, it's not blind, they, it's, you're not anonymous when you apply, but obviously not every board member knows every person applying. And so sometimes when we're trying to figure out, are you going to be a good teacher or how kind of excited are you about this subject or uh, trying to gauge that like thing, um, it's hard to do sometimes on paper. Um, for lots of reasons. Um, you can be incredibly passionate, but then honestly kind of a dud of a personality um, or things like that. We haven't had that happen in a recipient, but there's that hesitation when people are trying to, as a board, they're trying to read, right? And uh, we're trying to figure out that engagement. And so this elevator pitch, so it's a, a little different for each application, how that's done. So for the research award, it's just a written elevator pitch. And it's, um, a, it's done in a 30 word, like kind of a couple sentences at the top of your vision. So basically the goal being, right, if you know what an elevator pitch is, can you get me hooked on your idea before we hit the 10th floor, right? So that's kind of the idea. So in 30 words, can you get me hooked as a board member that I'm like, oh man, this sounds, this sounds great. Like this person, I would, I'd invest in you, right? Um, and so when it comes to the DZT, so that's a new requirement in the DZRA. When it comes to the DZTA, so the teaching award, which is the travel one, it's a video. Um, and so that, uh, and the requirements for our, the specifics of all this are very detailed in the application. But again, this idea of like, can you, can we see you a bit more actually talking about your idea, um, and getting a sense of why you chose it or in a sense of enthusiasm, or how do you even carry yourself as a teacher? And this is not to say that you have to be incredibly, you know, quaffed and put together and we're going to judge you on this of like, oh God, you're kind of socially awkward. We won't give you this award. Um, but it's just these little extra things that kind of help round out that just written vision. Um, and again, for that reason, if, you know, you're going to go forward with this and use all your different senses potentially to communicate what you're trying to talk about. And we just want to know, you know, can you communicate your idea well, even if it's just not in a written format essay. So those are extra things that we've added to the applications that people may not be as familiar with since they're newer um, requirements on the applications. And one thing I also just wanted to add too is, you know, if you are looking at, uh, our, you know, the application packet for either award and something is unclear or you're not sure about how to do a particular thing, please, please reach out. Uh, you can reach out to us at info at dzta.org. Bear with us, we're a very small organization. Our website is now dzte.org, but we are still maintaining our old email, which is info at dzta.org. But please reach out with any questions or concerns you might have about applying. Um, you know, we've, we've got a whole network of previous board members and recipients that we can connect you with who, you know, people who intimately know this application process really well, that we'd be happy to connect you with to direct your question towards. So please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or concerns about applying whatsoever. I think having an elevator elevator pitch is awesome because it it's a way for someone in someone to distill their passion into a small bit that you can ingest and be like, oh, I want to know more about that. Um, so I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So is there anything else that we didn't approach about the, the endowment that you feel like we need to talk about? Yes. Um, we are, as, as I was saying, we are a, a very teeny tiny organization. We're run by a board of directors that are all volunteers and two part-time administrators who work full-time jobs separately and aren't paid enough for the work that they do for us. Uh, we are, you know, we just started offering our second award last year. We want to offer more awards. We want to give away more money. Uh, we want to be providing, you know, educational programming in person and online year round. Uh, we've got big goals, big vision, big dreams. Um, and so, and, you know, we're essentially like trying to be the, you know, the NPR of cheese educational programming. You know, there's no, you know, of course, we love our big donors, but there's no agenda behind what we're doing. 
Um, you know, we've got a rotating board uh, every year, a third of the board goes out and a third uh, new people join. Uh, there are some people on the board that I only know in the context of being on the board. I've only met them on Zoom in board meetings. So it's not just like a bunch of friends or anyone, you know, that are deciding on the recipients. So like, we're really trying to just create really cool cutting edge, like cheese educational programming. Um, and, you know, we're working with a pretty small budget that we're always trying to, to grow. And every dollar, 10 cents, 20 cents, $5, $500, whatever, if you ever, we know the times are tough right now, but if anyone out there listening, if you ever have just a little bit of money to spare one month, we would certainly appreciate your tax deductible donation, um, which if you would like to make one, you can do so on our website at dzp.org. And with that, so we've, you know, we've raised money to fund that first scholarship. Like as Sam says, we have really good goals of wanting, we have a second scholarship, so we need to keep continue funding that. We want to provide more educational content. Again, this idea that I mentioned earlier, we're becoming this umbrella organization that isn't just identified only by like the two scholarships, right? There's mentorship opportunities we want to do and um, more content on our website, which takes time and people and resources and all that kind of stuff. And so that's what we're, what the fundraising will help is like doing that. And so in the past too, you know, and I say past, so P, uh, BC, before COVID, um, you know, people would do all sorts of different fun, cool ways of fundraising. And so while obviously just a monetary donation through the website is great, um, you know, in the past, we always had really great success with all sorts of different options. So on our website, we have listed you know, every event basically, which includes just little promo someone did at a cheese counter, um, a list on our website for inspiration on ideas. So if, yeah, if you're looking at your budget of your company um, or your thing and you're not really sure how you could budget a donation, but you think maybe you could host classes or you could run a promotion during um, American Cheese Month and donate a certain amount to that or feature, you know, cheeses from a certain country that uh, maybe one of the recipients went to. Um, and you can kind of highlight their presentation and raise money that way. Um, it's very flexible how you can raise money and do things. And so the website gives you lots of inspiration on different ideas. But then again, like Sam said, reach out. We've I've been doing this fundraising for 10 years um, and we can have a conversation talking about, you know, what is your business model? What is your services you offer? And how can we kind of make this a seamless, easy thing to do? Because a lot of the times when people hear the word fundraising, they get very intimidated, um, right? Because we've only ever seen these like political fundraising or like gala fundraising for like breast cancer awareness month, right? Like we're like, how does that work? Um, and so, yeah, when it comes to, we're, we're in this active place of fundraising, especially now because we have these big goals, but when you're scared on how to do that, um, we can help you on how to figure that out too. So yeah, make it fun, not be this kind of scary, awkward corporate fundraising thing, make it a fun, seamless thing that still continues cheese education too, right? We would love for that kind of partnership of this fundraising is to help your customers maybe get engaged, your mongers get engaged um, and spread the word about the cool things that are happening in the cheese community. Yes, one of the eight bazillion hats that, Jewel wears is expert fundraiser. So yeah, just to reiterate, if you have any thoughts about it, she will help you tailor your fundraiser to whatever your needs, uh, scale, anything are. She's the perfect person to talk to. In so many different ways. In so many different ways, certainly. <laughs> oh gosh, guys. A good person to know regardless. Um, all right. Well, thank you all so much for joining me and uh, giving me the the 411 on all of the endowment DZTE actionable items. <laughs> thank you so much for having us and letting us, you know, blabber and blabber on and on about it. Yeah. Thank you, Janae. You're always such a great person to connect to about all this stuff. So thank you. As an extra bonus, we asked some past recipients to send a note on how receiving this award has affected their careers. Eric Meredith here, DZTA recipient 2018, here to talk about how winning this award affected my career. And it starts with the vision writing process was really fundamental to me to, to start to think of this job that I had in the cheese industry as a career. And from there, after I saw Jess, Emily, Tom, Sam, Vince, what they were doing, the impact they were having, I knew, I knew this was the next step for me. 
since winning the award, I've moderated panels at ACS. I've been on the education committee, the regulatory and academic committee with ACS. I've maintained relationships that I developed during my research, during my travels with the international community. I've bolstered my consulting. Uh, I've been doing consulting all over the world, which has been really exciting. And I'm really excited to follow DZTE with these two scholarships they're now offering and see the passion that the youth of this industry still has. More to come. Super exciting. Anne Campbell, DZTA 2019 recipient. What can I say? I finally teach and read and write and stuff as, you know, my main gig. And the thing about the DZTA is that it lets cheese folks remember what cheese is really about, right? And it's not about unpaid overtime and being told to smile. You can't find the true meaning of cheese in a spreadsheet, right? It's not at the bottom of a P&L. And cheese is, it's a social relation. It's about the stories it tells about people and animals and microbes and plants and the soil and landscapes. It's nature culture. And that's why we love it. And you can't get away from cheese. It stays with you. And the best thing about cheese people, I guess, is that it reminds me that no matter how niche or obscure or weird sounding your interest is, when you think something's worth studying, worth writing about, worth learning about, it's going to gather a global network of people who agree with you and want to know more. And that's the kind of stuff that keeps me going. Hi, this is Tom Perry, 2015 recipient of the Daphne Zeppos Teaching Award. Uh, the way that the award impacted my career uh, is it allowed me to uh, answer a question that I had been wondering about for years. Uh, and it also gave me the opportunity to interact with uh, people with such a deep knowledge of my topic, which was uh, the microbial cultures used for cheese making, uh, that I'm still learning from what I learned, uh, all those years ago. Uh, I highly recommend, uh, anyone that is interested in applying for either DZTA or DZRA, uh, to do it because, uh, it's just the best way to take advantage of, uh, some really amazing knowledge. Mary Casella, DZRA 2021 recipient. Receiving the DZRA was a big moment for me. It may sound over the top, but it's really been life-changing. It gave me the push I needed to leave a job I was super unhappy with, and I found nothing but joy along my research path. I'm very happy in a new job now, but I really think that receiving this award will have a bigger lifelong effect on my career. My research has connected me with so many new amazing people, and I only see that continuing. And I truly think this will be lifelong work, far from being over after my final presentation. I hope that we've been able to alleviate any fears out there about applying for this fantastic award. Thank you again to Jewel and Sam for easing tensions and for working so hard continuing to keep Daphne's legacy as dynamic as she was. This podcast is recorded, produced, and edited by me, Janae Muha. Thank you to Ben Muha for allowing me to use your music. Follow along on my cheesy adventures at Instagram, Facebook, or get more content at Patreon. My website is also a great hub for all of my goings-on. Thanks for listening, and remember to keep spreading the word of good curd. Curd.